Thank you for joining us. Please mute as you join. Welcome to everyone who's joined. Please mute yourself when you join. Francine, would you like to begin? Yes. Good evening. My name is Eve Francine Stokes McElvin. Welcome. And thank you for joining the women of Epsilon Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated presentation, celebrating the life and legacy of Mae Miller. At this time, let me introduce Mrs. Jan Wood Carter, president of Epsilon Omega chapter followed by Ms. Carol Robinson, our target chair for the arts. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking the time out of your Sunday afternoon to join us for this presentation. We are very glad that you are here and we hope that you will enjoy our presentation celebrating the life of Mae Miller, who is someone that's very special to Epsilon Omega chapter because she is one of Epsilon Omega chapter's charter members. And welcome to our panelists, Thank you for agreeing to be part of this. I hope everybody will sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Carol was not able to join us this evening, but I'd like to introduce Carol Robinson, who is the Epsilon Omega Chapter Target 4 Chair. And my name is Sandy Adams, and I'm a member of Target 4 and the videographer. Thank you. Many of you may ask the question, well, just who was Mae Miller? Epsilon Omega Chapter was chartered on December the 2nd, 1921. One of the 10 charter members was Mae Miller a Howard University graduate who was an educator and a widely published female playwright and poet of the Harlem Renaissance. This I'm gonna put it up here. We recognized her achievements. Let's view a video of Mae Miller. Thank you. 
the federal poet just published this poem in the fall, and I've called it Mankind. We are all of mankind. Surrender a fancied dream of birth. Accept science of recent years. To date, Africa marks the first form of man. Here in dust, most recent proof lies. History here emerges, bone by bone. Dig, dig, dig. May Africa reward this search, if only through eroded bones. Fit them together, date them, shape the skeleton of earliest man. This is history. Sing another song in vain. In vain contrive a different tune. Dust will prevail. It always does. May Miller was born in Washington, D.C. to Kelly and Annie May Miller. She was one of the Miller's five children. Her father, Kelly Miller, was the professor and founder of the Department of Sociology at Howard University. Her house, which was located on the Howard University campus, was a gathering place for the black intellectuals and artists of the time, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, and Langston Hughes. She graduated from Howard University in 1920, earning an award for her one-act play, Within the Shadows. May completed graduate studies in poetry and drama at American University and Columbia University. In 1925, her play, The Bog Guide, placed third in the Opportunity Magazine contest that was primarily read by African Americans, helping plan her in the black cultural scene and the Harlem Renaissance. After completing her studies, May taught English and speech for 20 years at Frederick Douglass High School in Baltimore, Maryland. In 1954, she married her husband of 41 years, John Bud Sullivan, who was a high school principal. After she stopped teaching in Baltimore, Miss Miller redoubled her poetry writing efforts. Her verse was published in magazines and in several collections, including The Clearing and Beyond in 1974, and collected poems of May Miller appearing in 1989. May Miller was an active member of S Street Salon, hosted by Georgia Douglas Johnson for writers and poets of the time. Other than May, other prominent Harlem Renaissance writers who attended include Langston Hughes and Jean Toomer. The salons were held at Miss Johnson's residence in Washington, D.C. In the 1970s, May Miller read her poetry publicly at several high-profile celebrations. May Miller Sullivan, 96, a Washington poet, playwright, and educator whose literary career began in the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s, died of pneumonia February 8th at her home in Washington, D.C. We are honored to be joined this evening by her friends, family, and colleagues who will help us to celebrate the life and legacy of May Miller. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Janet Sims Wood. She is a retired assistant chief librarian at the Moreland Spring God Research Center at Howard University for Reference Reader Services. She has taught Black women's history courses at the University of Maryland and currently works part-time for the Prince George's Community College Library as an assistant professor, adjunct faculty librarian. Dr. Sims Wood is a founding associate editor of SAGE a scholarly journal for Black women that published the anthology Double Stitch, 
Black women write about mothers and daughters. She's a former member of the Maryland Humanities Council of Speakers Bureau and National Vice President of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. She has served as a consultant for such special grant projects as the three volume series, Voices of Triumph for Time Life Books, for WETA, public television documentary on Marian Anderson, as well as an oral historian interviewing World War II veterans for the DC Special Arts. In 2004, Dr. Sims Woods co-edited the Black mm -hmm. History Month Learning Resources Manual before Brown, Beyond Boundaries, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. In 2015, she was awarded the Honor Book Award from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association for her book, Dorothy Porter Wesley at Howard University, Building a Legacy of Black History, published by the History Press. On March the 10th, 2018, she received the Harriet, the Harriet Tugman, Harriet Ross Tugman Lifetime Achievement Award from Baltimore's Black Heritage Tours. I'll ask you now to put all questions in the chat and following the panelists' presentations, a Q&A will follow. And now let's hear from Dr. Janet Sims Wood. Thank you, Sarah Francine. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Good evening. We hope that you enjoyed the video, the wonderful video you just saw on Mae Miller. And as we honor her today as a charter member of Epsilon Omega chapter, we have a lively and knowledgeable panel to give highlights on Mae Miller's life and legacy. Um, I will call out the panelist's name and after each panelist speaks, uh, and we will have a question and answer at the end. So our panelists today will be Dr. Ida Jones, Mr. Brian Gilmore, Mr. Ethelbert Miller, and I will speak on behalf of uh, Ruby Mills is sick today and was not able to participate. So I'll speak a little bit about our work with Mae Miller. And our last speaker will be uh, Dr. Miller Newman. And could you please put your uh, questions in the chat? So Dr. Jones, could you go ahead and get us started? Yes, good evening, and thank you, Epsilon Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha. It is a lovely uh, honor of one of your charter members and a daughter of Howard University. I'm very excited to be here today. My connection to Mae Miller is through her father, Kelly Miller, who was a very stalwart member of Howard University's faculty and a graduate as well. So I'm just to talk to you very briefly about the five children he had, but in particular to focus on Mae Miller Sullivan. He had three sons and two daughters in the order of Kelly Miller II, who was born in 1895 and became a dentist. And he had nicknames for all of his children. So Kelly Miller II was called Pike. Then he had a son named Isaac Newton Miller, and he was a math major. So he really was affinity with math and science. So Isaac Newton Miller was um, the second child and his name, nickname was, let's see if I can find it here. I have to come back to that. But he died rather unexpectedly at a very young age, his early 30s, and had two daughters. So the widow and the two children moved in and lived with him. And I actually had the pleasure of being able to talk to the daughter, Gloria Miller, um, Newton Miller, because she lived with him as a small child. And her son, Paul, was taking care of her um, before she passed away. Then, and he was born in 1896. May Miller was the first daughter. She was born in 1900 and her nickname was Tom. And I see that in the Howard yearbook, they also mentioned Tom. So I'd love to have someone could unpack the origins of Tom, it'd be very fascinating. But she says that she was his favorite child. And so she claimed her father in a very um, affinity and esteemed way. And I'm gonna close with a poem she wrote uh, about him on his passing. So actually Kelly Miller number two was called Scrump Isaac Newton Miller was called Pike, and then May Miller was called Tom. Then the second daughter, Irene Miller, her nickname was Syl, and she was born in 1902, uh, and his last son, Paul Miller, was nicknamed Monk, and he was born in 1907. So he had his children between 1896 and 1907. They lived and grew on the ground of Howard University, and the house you saw at 225 4th Street was university property, 
And that's where the Negro Academy would also meet. So Paul Lawrence Dunbar and literary notables from around the world would come through 2225 4th Street. So I just wanna close the poem that Mae Miller wrote on the occasion of her father's passing. And I love to hear her voice and intoning. So she titled this, My Father. With springtime, my father comes alive. In the lilac bush he planted, at the kitchen door, that we might hear the plain voice of Walt Whitman burst through the bloom. In the season's green-tipped hedge, he lives again. And she did make sure that she honored her father and sought to have his biography he was writing published, which she never had the capacity to finish, but it is housed at Moore and Spingarn. So I'm hoping to look at that manuscript and get that out. And I thank May Miller for stewarding her father's legacy. So thank you so much and to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And also, could you put the title of your book on Kelly Miller in the chat? Um, so yes, the people are know. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's librarians. <laughs> okay, our next speaker, again, and also if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Our next speaker will be uh, Mr. Brian Gilmore. And you talk a little bit about yourself and also how your relationship with, with uh, Lee Miller. Uh, yes, thank you very much for including me in this program. Um, I'm Brian Gilmore. I'm a poet, native Washingtonian, like Mae Miller, and I am doing research on DC poetry, black poets in the 20th century right now. And of course, Mae Miller is kind of central to that. So that's my relationship. I never had a chance to meet her as a poet, but of course I've been reading her work for many, many years. So I'm gonna read a portion of what I've written based on some of the research I found. And as a small anecdote, I will add that my father attended Douglas High School in Baltimore. So you never know, maybe she, she was his English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> if you read the early personal writings of poet and playwright Mae Miller when she was just a teenager, you soon understand how it is that she became a prolific writer and so well-respected. Her command of the English language on the page is self-evident. The first time I lost myself, in the musings of Miller, when she, a, when she was a young student at Howard University in Washington, DC. I was most impressed with the many pages of handwritten letters and diary entries that did not contain any obvious grammatical or spelling errors. It is apparent she is conscious of the need to write to communicate with a high degree of social societal professionalism. At this point in her life, Mae Miller was a confident writer. She had already published literary works and she aspired to study the arts and to teach. She was a homegrown, barred, bred, and a tight-knit, segregated African-American community who always exhibited her best. In one of her many letters to her older brother, Kelly Jr., Mae Miller writes on January 18, 1918, quote, examination is all one can hear on campus. Every other student seems to be writing a 50-page theme. Later, in the same letter, a passage concerns the now legendary Howard University-based theater organization, Stylus. The Stylus held its initiation last Saturday night. The way in which its new members acted was interesting. They learned passages from the Bible with more earnestness than in a Sunday school class. One member suggested, we initiate the whole student body so that all the students may know one biblical passage. That Miller was situated at the center of at least part of Washington, D.C. Black literary scene at Howard is not surprising. She is only 18 at the time and was involved in the founding of Stylus from the beginning. Miller, unlike the literary organizer and writer Georgia Douglas Johnson, was from Washington, D.C. She is a child of the city and a child of the city's Black striver class those African-Americans who were able to navigate the difficulties of America's racial caste system and its Jim Crow laws through a combination of luck, determination, family, community ties, and education. May Miller's success as a writer and as a public figure for much of the 20th century is hardly surprising because of her father, Kelly Miller. Kelly Miller attended Howard University on scholarship and would eventually create the school's sociology department. He was Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Howard from 1907 to 1919, and he was a prolific writer of essay and commentary 
in many of the nation's leading newspapers and magazines. It is Miller's home where Paul Lawrence Dunbar lodged when he first came to Washington, D.C. in the 1890s. It is impossible to talk about Mae Miller and the poetry scene in Washington without talking about her father. He was, to put it mildly, an intellectual. The fact that he was a Black American intellectual born of a slave mother and a free Black father only adds to the power of their story. To add, and according to the Library of Congress, Kelly Miller was an educator, mathematician, writer, and advocate for African-American education. It is often suggested that May Miller's presence and role in the history of Black poetry in Washington, D.C. is understated. This is not true. May Miller, as many of the city can attest, is a major literary figure in the city and significantly so in Black literary circles. She is also known outside the city as a significant contributor to the Black literary canon in America through her plays, poems, and presence. Michael Harper, the late great poet and author of the legendary volume of poems, Dear John, Dear Coltrane, described Mae Miller as a teacher and cultural bearer with a great heart and soul. She has never withdrawn from the complexities and contradictions of the world. Robert Hayden, the Detroit poet, and once the poetry consultant to the Library of Congress wrote that Mae Miller writes with quiet strength, lyric intensity, and that she is perceptive and compassionate. And the poet O.B. Hardison describes Mae Miller as a poet who writes with an authentic note of love and warmth. It is just the kind of words and tributes Mae Miller receives here. It is the fact that words are coming from a cross section of some of America's great literary figures and minds. She was born in Washington on January 26, 1899 just three months before Edward Kennedy, Duke Ellington. Mae Miller confirms that it was a father, while not a poet himself, who pushed the love of poetry toward her children. Her mother, on the other hand, maintained a neat and orderly, disciplined home. But it was a father who passed down his intellectual curiosities to the intellectual Mae Miller. Ever since I can remember, a neat tale of Washington, D.C. folklore persisted that when Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the poet, came to the city early on, he not only stayed with Kelly Miller and his family, but he slept in May's bed. However, this story is not true. May Miller was born in 1899, and Dunbar first came to see her father well before May was even born. Dunbar was likely gone from the city. But Dunbar still made a connection with the little girl who would go on to become one of the city's most important writers. According to May, in an interview with Grace Cavallari, Dunbar, one of his early visits to the Miller home, inscribed a book for their newborn son, Kelly. Though Dunbar's gesture is for her older brother, and she is not even yet born, she still savors the moment. I was born a little late for this, she said to Cavallari, but my oldest brother was a baby when Paul Lawrence Dunbar visited. And when he asked my mother, what shall I give the baby? My mother said, your first book, Mr. Dunbar. And he wrote on the fly leaf of that book, a poem to my brother. Miller adds that her brother never cared much for poetry. Miller says, I should have been born then. And that book should have been dedicated to me. That book is in a bookcase in my home, she adds. It is likely Miller was going to pursue the arts and a literary life anyway. In 1913, Miller was 14 years old, but began to get published. She received a check for 25 cents from the School for Progress in Philadelphia for a story she had written. The check was accompanied by a letter from the School Progress League, where she was informed that the story she admitted would be published in August 1913. We're very well pleased with your efforts and hope you will try again very soon, they wrote. Decades later, in a conversation with Grace Cavallari, Miller said she told her father she never cashed that check of 25 cents. One year later, Miller was published again in the Washington Post. There was another contest and 15 year old May Miller earned $3 for a story called Wireless in Squirreldom. The story was printed in full in the newspaper on October 4, 1914. And I'll stop right there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and again, don't forget to put your uh, questions in the chat if you have some. Our next speaker will be uh, Ethelbert Miller. And uh, could you talk a little about yourself and your relationship with uh, May Miller? Well, I'll begin with saying that May and I always used to joke about our relationship. We were not married, 
We were not brothers and sisters. <laughs> that was an ongoing joke. But um, my name is Ethelbert Miller. I'm a literary activist and writer, and I host uh, On the Margin on WPFW. Um, I probably would not have met Mae Miller if the writer and publisher Amazu Bolton hadn't come into my life in 1974. Amazu Bolton was a poet and publisher who was born in Poplarville, Mississippi and grew up in Derrida, Louisiana. When I met him, he was editing Hoodoo Magazine and operating Energy Black South Press. Hoodoo Magazine was one of the important African-American small press publications started in the 1970s, the others being Obsidian and Callaloo. Zoo Bolton's trademark was his coveralls. When I met him, he reminded me of SNCC civil rights leader, James Foreman. The coveralls gave Zoo Bolton a Southern and rural look. So when he stood next to Mae Miller, they presented an odd couple. Mae Miller in many ways was my introduction to the Washington middle class. One almost expected her to wear white gloves when reading her poetry. Amos knew Mae Miller and had published her work before he came to DC. He might have been responsible for the publication of Not That Far by Mel Miller. And this is a copy of that. This small chapbook was published by Solo Press in 1973. The cover design was by the visual artist Charles Seabury, a Kentucky born artist who lived in DC and was a good friend of May Miller's. Seabury was a painter and playwright. He was a friend of the poet Owen Dotson, who taught at Howard University. But when Seabury lived in New York, he was a good friend of Billy Holiday and Billy Strayhorn. Seabury moved to DC in 1947 and lived in DC until his death in 1985. Uh, I make that connection to Seabury because people who have known May Miller and who have visited her home talked about uh, May being a collective African American art. And I think with her uh, relationship to Charles Seabury, we see that she's had that relationship with African American uh, visual artists as well as African American writers. Uh, when I look at my copy of Not That Far, uh, I know then that I actually met May Miller on August 10th, 1974. Um, so that, that can be documented. This small chapbook consists of 14 poems, 13 of them capturing various geographical locations, Portugal, Spain, Turkey, Greece, and Italy. I never got a chance to talk to May to see if these were places she visited during her lifetime. Now, because of Amazu Bolton's friendship with May Miller, when we received money from the DC Commission of Arts uh, to edit the first DC anthology of black poetry, Synergy, which is this book here, Synergy Anthem there, this is the anthology. We dedicated the book to Mae Miller and Arthur P. Davis, uh, our two elders. I was close to, uh, to Arthur P. Davis and Honest was close to Mae Miller. And so the book was dedicated to them and published in 1975. Um, in this anthology, the poem, The Washingtonian Speaks is presented and Amos was able to obtain that poem from May. And I believe this poem was written in honor of Walter Washington becoming the mayor of DC. Uh, Washington was elected mayor of DC in 1974. He was mayor from 1975 to 1979. Um, when May included this poem in her book, Dust of Uncertain Journey in 1975, she changed the title to The Washingtonian. By removing the word speaks, from the original title, Washingtonian Speaks, the poem becomes more than a conversational statement and strengthens the opening line. The opening line of that poem is, possessed of this city, we are born into kinship with its people. Miller's opening words in, in a way echoes that of Walt Whitman who once walked the streets of Washington, DC. Now in the Synergy Anthology, Amazu Bolton and I republished not that far. That's why I believe that Amazu published it initially as a, as a chapbook because when we decided to select work for the anthology, that's immediately what he selected in terms of including. Now the Synergy Anthology also includes a poem dedicated to Mae Miller by the poet Dolores Kendry. Dolores Kendrick would be appointed the second DC Port Laureate in 1999. Kendrick's poem is entitled Snowing in Venice. Now, when we place the Kendrick poem alongside Miller, we see two African-American women influenced by Europe and writing about, a, about home as a theme. And I find it fascinating these are two black women traveling throughout um, Europe. When I also met May in the 1970s, she was also serving as a member of the DC Arts Commission and poet and critic Larry Neal was directing the commission at that time. Uh, I think that when we see May functioning on the commission, you see this is an indication of a willingness to volunteer her time in support of the arts. As I mentioned, it was Amazu Bold who introduced me to May Miller, and we did two things that I think are important to know. One, Amazu and I went over to May's apartment on S Street and recorded an hour interview 
in the 1970s. And I believe it probably was in August because that's when I got my book signed. So we were exact date for that. We also invited um, May Miller to Howard University to read at the African American Resource Center. And I do recall a, a conversation near the window between May Miller and Dr. Russell Adams, where as was, Adams asked, well, are you like related to, you know, um, Kelly Miller? And, and, and he said something about, um, relationship to the boys and he said no it's not the big two it's like, like you know it's not just the boys and Booker T. Washington it's also my father <laughs> you know so you you got that sort of trinity there when you deal with with, with black angela thinking and I always I always remember that because I thought that really so how May was very proud of, of her father um, and I also like the fact that I think for that friendship that she had with Amazon Bolton that that might have been the first time May Miller was invited to Howard to read her poetry um, now the other thing that um Miller played an active role in was um, reactivating the stylist that Brian was talking about. Um, the South Literary Society at Howard, um, she react, helped it reactivate in the 1980s. And this organization was established in 1916 by Elaine Locke and Dr. Montgomery uh, from 1960 to 1935. They had a stylist journal that was published. And it was a magazine that existed to encourage literary expression at Howard University. Um, in 1994, when I published my anthology in search of color everywhere, I included May Miller's poem, A Closing. And this is my, one of my favorite poems um, um, by May Miller. It's just 17 lines, but when you hear this, you really, it's just a beautiful poem, in, in a closing. In a house of empty rooms, I thought I heard a door close down the long hall. I couldn't know whether someone had entered, whether someone had left, no further step simply the closing of a door, an absence of other defined stir, more like the hum of water in a hidden spring, like a stark echo from an exacting hill I could not measure. I reached for the reassuring hand. It was not there. He had gone ahead. Very beautiful poem. Um, and, 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 and now it, it is May Miller, I have to thank for my first book of poems that was not a chapbook, Seas of Hunger, Cry of Rain. May introduced me to Naomi Long Magic the founder of Lotus Press. And she recommended my work for publication. My book was published in 1982 with an introduction by Jim Jordan. Naomi Magic was the poet laureate of Detroit as well as the founder of Lotus Press. And her press would become an important for publishing African-American poetry as Broadside Press started by Dudley Randall in Detroit. Magic started her company in 1972 and was appointed the poet laureate of Detroit in 2001 by Mayor Dennis Harcher. This is very important because you see how the people, the company, you know, this is echoing sort of what Brian was talking about. When you look at the company that, that um, May Miller was keeping, just when you go back and look at who's winning those awards at Opportunity Magazine, May Miller is right there with Zorni Hurston, okay? When we look at the, 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 the recent uh, past, uh, all of the major poets, like Robert Hayden and others, are friends of, of May Miller. And so she makes sure that she's not overlooked. And it must be, it would be very interesting to see what correspondence there is between Naomi Magic as well as Robert Hayden and, and May Miller. May had, would publish three books with Lotus Press, Dust of Uncertain Journey, uh, in which um, um, that has a blurb that Brian talked about by Robert Hayden. The Ransom Weight, published in 1983, which is dedicated to Robert Hayden because Robert Hayden was dying in, in 1980. And then the collected poems of May Miller are also published by, by Lotus Press. Uh, and in the, um, the Ransom Weight, there's a short bibliography. So for scholars who want to do more research on um, May Miller, there's a short bibliography that's in there. The other thing which I find interesting about some of the books, um, and this is the, um, the Ransom Weight, it's a photograph, but it's just not any photograph. It's a photograph by the photographer, William Stafford. And Stafford was a poor consultant to the Library of Congress in 1970. So it's not just another photograph. It's a, it's a, it's a photograph by, by a, um, a um, poet laureate, or at that time it was poetry consultant. I wanna expand, and that's just a last comment I'm gonna make. I wanna expand on, on the quote that um, Brian mentioned. Um, it's by Obi Hardison and, and Brian quoted like about like, about, I think two lines, Brian, but I wanna read the whole thing and, and end on that. This is, this is by Obi Hardison. May Miller has been one of the leaders of Washington's poetry community for many years. She has organized readings, worked to attract audiences of poetry, served on committees and spoken and written eloquently on behalf of poetry as a means of personal enrichment and a broadening of the essential humanity that each individual shares with others. 
Her statue is indicated by her published work and by the request of the Library of Congress that she contribute her papers to its archives. May Miller is a Washington institution as well as a Washington poet, one of the three senior poets of the city and without question, its most distinguished black poet. Her poetry, however, is no way parochial. It expresses a fine sense of English and American literary tradition and it's warmly personal and sometimes satiric or angry but sometimes it's a terrible angry, but never merely sentimental. It's as much pleasure to read as it is to hear what she reads. And so that's by Obi Hardison, who for many years was head of the Foley Shakespeare Library. And I end on this note that those words that by Obi is I guess what this program does that when we honor uh, Mae Miller today, we honor the best in ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ethelbert. Uh, this evening, um, Ruby Sales was supposed to be on the panel tonight, but she's sick. So, uh, she and I worked together and uh, we both uh, knew Mae Miller. And I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, the at home project that we had. Uh, back in the eighties, Ruby and I started this, this program called At Home and we were interviewing elder black women. Uh, we had them to come and tell their stories. And uh, so Mae Miller was one of those people. And uh, the At Home series, the reason we called it At Home was because as you know, as you, as you heard, uh, we could not go into hotels to speak and things of that nature. So people met at uh, Douglas, uh, uh, Georgia Douglas Johnson's home at uh, S Street Salon. And of course, May also had a salon called the Saturday Salon. That, and people would come and speak and read poetry and they do their literary writings and things of that nature. So uh, that was the reason we called it at home. So some of the people that we had were, uh, out of New York, we had Elizabeth Carnegie, who was a noted uh, nurse. Also, Jean Blackwell Hudson from the Schomburg Center. Um, and locally, we had um, Merch Tate, who was a history teacher at Howard. Um, and we had Dorothy Porter Wesley, who was the curated Mona Spingarn. And uh, so these were some of the people that we would have. And what we would do, we would have people to come uh, of the age group of the person that we were interviewing. We'd have some young people to come as well. And some, uh, so we had different age groups. So we wanted to introduce these women uh, to all age groups so that people would know who they were. And also to let the women know that their stories were important. important. So it was really a, a very nice setting that we would have. And of course, May Miller was one of the people that, that we had. And um, so Ruben and I spent a lot of time at, at May Miller's apartment. And one of the Sundays that we were there, I don't know what the occasion was, but Dorothy Porter was there and a couple of other people, I'm not sure, I can't remember who all was there. But uh, I also relate that Mae Miller was not just a poet, she was also funny. She was hilarious. And uh, so Dorothy Porter was talking about uh, the fact that her husband, James Porter, had taught her how to make martinis. And Mae Miller said, and he, and he taught me how to drink them. So, I mean, she was just a funny lady. So out of this also, uh, a couple of years later, uh, a company out of um, Atlanta republished one of Kelly Miller's uh, uh, books. And so they asked me to come down with her to, uh, to Atlanta because they were gonna do a, a book, uh, book launch there. So uh, on the plane going down, the gentleman in front of us had a seat back towards us and he was bald and May Miller kept doing this, trying to thump his head. So, I mean, the two of us were laughing like crazy. I don't know why they did <laughs> say that they do it. So I finally grabbed May Miller's hands and just held him so, so we could get to Atlanta without hurting anybody. So, <laughs> but we had a good time. And um, while we were there, we stayed on, uh, also stayed on, um, we had the book launching at a, a black bookstore that, uh, that Sunday. And then on that Monday, uh, we were staying on uh, Spelman's campus. And so they had a group of students to come in and uh, sit in the parlor. And of course, May Miller was the bell of the ball that weekend because she got a chance to not only talk about her father, but she also got a chance to talk about her life and to uh, read some of her poetry. So we always had a good time when we were uh, with May Miller. She was uh, uh, just, uh, genuinely wonderful lady to be involved with. And I was, I was so happy that we got a chance uh, to talk with her. So our, our last speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Miller Newman. 
and um, Dr. Newman, could, uh, could you tell a little about yourself and uh, your relationship? I, and you are a relative. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it has been fascinating listening to others' perceptions of May Miller. I have none of those. <laughs> um, I had none of that to fall back on. She was my aunt. So her professional life was separate from mine. And it was not until I was much older and by then she was much more stubborn. So uh, <laughs> things um, um, became interesting for her once she retired from public life and uh, required far more assistance um, to remain in her home. So um, my husband and I uh, and Suzanne uh, shared responsibility for caring for her. But we became involved in her life because a librarian, whoo, great librarian at Morgan called us and said that there was a man there who wanted to, um, pedal is not the word she used, that's the word I'm using, um, a manuscript uh, of May Miller's. And so, because she was a high school girlfriend of my elder brothers, she, reached out and said, something is amiss here because this guy is up here saying that he has all of this stuff. And by the time we were able to intercede, he did have a lot of her stuff. So um, those were losses. And what, but one of the most difficult things for me was the, um, idea that this man had befriended her and told her that he could get her unpublished novel published. So that never happened, but rather than publish it, he copyrighted it. Mm -hmm. So that has been um, a real loss, I think for May, more than anyone, to have this white man, doctor, professor, come in and, theory and steal from her. And when I asked her about it, I said, well, Aunt May, he says, you gave it to him. She said, do you know how crazy I'd have to be to give away a novel? Do you know how much work that is? Nobody in their right mind gives away a novel. And unfortunately, by the time we knew that, the cultural studies, the Center for Cultural Studies, uh, and this Dr. McCray had copyrighted the novel. That was years and years ago, um, so back in 95. Um, but the novel, the tragedy, in addition to her, not getting credit for being able to, for the published work is that she portrays Negro. And I specifically use Negro rather than black because she would like fall over if she knew I was saying, calling her black. So her Negro experience and the experience of the Negro in Baltimore is such a riveting story because it is ordinary life. And set in 1900s, she has a scene where um, one of the characters goes and, and befriends one of the vendors at the Baltimore market. She talks about this one, about how black people celebrate Halloween. I for one did not know that black people celebrated Halloween other than the traditional door-to-door -door knock thing. 
but she speaks of parades and children and what they do and what adults do. So um, what I wanted to do was end my presentation by simply reading an excerpt of her novel because even as a young woman novelist, she was good. So I hear her in the back of my head saying, you said you were gonna read, read. So <laughs> let me do that. Um, the avenue was a scene of revelry. The pavements were lined, the streets were full, doorways off the street were jammed, windows above the streets were crowded with hulky figures, automobile horns, tin horns, wash tubs, old lard pails, queer rattles, any noise making contraption furnished the deafening din. The afternoon had been the children's, the evening belonged to the adults. Cellars, garrets, old trunks, family closets. ransacked for costumes. The merrymakers had found them or they had made them. The old mingled unashamed with the new. Overalls and bandanas, clowns, balloon suits and steeple caps, cutaway coats and high silk hats, schoolboys flowing ties and short breeches, creatures from fairy kingdoms, slaves from cotton fields, women of today, ladies of yesterday, tiny dwarfed gnomes, tall stilted scarecrows, slender wisp-like figures, plump bepillowed figures, white faces, pink faces, yellow faces, tan faces, brown faces, black faces, some painted, some unpainted, blending in confusion that evaded description. So I never saw a Halloween like that. Right. Um, and to know that there was a parade, a gala, all about black people on this uh, celebrating this holiday so differently from what it has become and what so many other things have done. But I just like the book. I really, I think she did a, a masterful job and um, had she had a masterful editor, she probably would have had this published herself. A uh, couple of, uh, and so for clarity purposes though, um, they caught Ruby, they called her Tom, Aunt May says, because she was a tomboy. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Um, and was it you, Ethelbert, who asked about the poems in, on, in Europe? Um, yes, all the poems are based on visits. As a matter of fact, I was looking at a, a little tiny notebook she carried on her travels and um, jotted down notes about different places. And my grandson has promised that he's going to come and get these old, um, what are those things? Three by three things, pictures. What do you call those things? They're not 33 and a third. Those are records. Those slides. Oh, slides. Okay. Slides. Because she she had she and Bus, when they did travel, he was the photographer and he took a great many slides. And um when she died, I think I just snapped up the the um the slide box and it's still down in my basement, I think. So um, that those are the answers to the questions that I got and you were right. She was, she was not a sentimental person, but um, she was hugely instrumental in generations of her family. Um, it bothered me when her obituary in the post said that she had she died without children because while she was biologically childless she had lots of children many of whom are here on this call today so um for that reason i, I wanted to to say to everybody that that may was the grand dam of aunts like she was the grand dam of poetry like she was the grand dam of 
that word is pronounced respite. Who knew? So that was May Miller. Thank you. We'd like to thank all of the panelists today. You have got, given us a really great glimpse of the legacy, life and legacy of May Miller Sullivan. So uh, we would now uh, go to the questions and answers. And if Sarah, Sandra, and, uh, and Francine will also make sure that we get everybody that, any questions that are in the, uh, the chat. I see one here that it asked if, uh, if the Kelly Miller School in Northeast DC was named after May Miller's father. And uh, yes, it was. Uh, and I see Ida, you have put your the title of your book in the uh, in the chat and uh, on Kelly Miller and the how to uh, get in touch about getting a copy. Uh, we had another one that says, uh, I read that May Miller attended the S Street Salon every Saturday at the home of Georgia Douglas Johnson. Do you know the names of other black artists and writers who are in attendance with May at these meetings? And did May ever speak about that experience? Um, she didn't speak to us about it that I can remember. Uh, Brian, do you know, or Ethelbert, do you know if uh, some of the other people that might've been there if she talked about it? This this might come up with maybe Jeffrey Stewart who did the ma major biography on Lane Locke. Uh -huh. he, interview, he interviewed um, May Miller. Uh, so maybe in the course of his, doing his research, she might've told him some of the people who, you know, attended some of the functions. I also dropped in a link there of some, with some of the names from some of the research we, we found, which include Elaine Locke, Carter G. Woodson, Andrew Weld, um, Zora Neale Hairston, Jean Toomer. And we mentioned some of that in the video that we, we ran prior to the, uh, to the panel. So all the huge names of the time. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that while May was a member of the salon, um, I think that her brother Kelly and Georgia were better friends than May and Georgia. And I think that because Kelly was an inveterate scrapbooker and he left a scrapbook of stuff about Georgia, which I always thought was so very interesting. And May only talked about the salon in passing, which was very different than, than um, you know, she, I, I just don't think that she was as engaged in that, in the salon life as we have made her out to be, but I don't know that she was not, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, did May ever touch on the adversity she's personally faced during the Harlem Renaissance as a poet or how it may have affected her family? That should have been a, a monumental time to really progress and push forward uh, for the black community. Anybody wanna to speak to that? For me, I'm thinking that, you know, a lot of times they didn't talk about some of the bad experiences that they they had, they kind of kept some of some of those things to themselves. Uh, so she never talked to me about uh, any of the hardships that they have had. Um, Ethelberta, Brian, uh, Ida, any in, in Kelly's no, I, book. No, I, I never had those type of conversations with her. Mm -hmm. It's nothing that I, yeah. in my research that I noticed. A lot of the events that a lot of writers from DC were involved in Harlem Renaissance, but a lot of the events occurred in New York. And I know Jean Toomer has a big thing of letters. You know, her name pops up every now and then, but as Georgia Douglas Johnson's name is much more prominent in the letters when, when he's referring to DC and stuff like that. Uh, another question was, do you, are there any plans to adopt one of May Miller's plays into a film? Uh, not that I know of. I would, I, I am dropping into the chat, however, a really interesting um, series that they did in New York on a lot of different um, icons. Uh, I actually got this information from Dr. Jones and um, they did one on May. So I just dropped it in the chat. So if you go to that page, 
you can actually listen to an adaptation of um, not actually a play, but sort of her life and how she would have reacted during this time. Sort of they put together these things on icons of the movement. And so for people who want to see more, uh, I think it's a really nice, um, I got a chance to listen to it. It's a really nice adaptation to listen to. So I just dropped that in the chat as well. So thank you. Hello. You know, one of the other things you might think about which has a lot to do with this actual program. You never know how a program like this plants the seeds for some African-American woman filmmaker who mm -hmm. says, well, okay, I, did, I didn't know about like, you know, Dorothy West or Mae Mill, and all of a sudden they decide, you know, to do something. So this program becomes very, very important because you never know, there could be a young woman who's film, film school somewhere, she hears about Mae Miller, finds some of her work and decides that, okay, this work was, you know, just like Miller Newman was reading an excerpt from the novel about Halloween. And someone says, well, that pulled me in to wanting to do this film about, about Mae Miller, something that she wrote. And programs like these introduce people to, uh, we talk about the real, real famous people, but they're local people who made an impact. And that was one of the reasons I do with Black Women's History is because we want to get the information out about the everyday Black woman who was working in that community, doing things. And uh, so hopefully, uh, as Ethelbert said, maybe this will spark some interest in, in someone doing a film on her. Well, you know, Janet, when you Can look I at that chat room, you know, one of the names that's mentioned uh, along with the others is Bruce Nugent. Mm -hmm. and, and because Newton was one of the openly gay people of the, of, the, of the Harlem Renaissance, you know, many gay activists have pointed to Bruce Nugent's work. And, and Nugent would have been totally ignored if there had not been a number of African-American gay men who said, okay, you know, before Essex Hemphill, it was Bruce Nugent. And that's been very important for, for people to say, okay, this person's work, of, um, not just, I like it, maybe it saves my life. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Could we also add to that some discussion about the Black Renaissance? I know Dr. Battle would always say that it was a Black Renaissance because it was happening in Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit. So it wasn't just Harlem. We've, we've allowed ourselves to narrow just to Harlem, and Harlem was a cosmopolitan space. But there was a Black Renaissance. So there's an arts movement in Baltimore City. There's one in Washington, D.C. So I think when you look at the idea of the Black Renaissance, even Pittsburgh to some extent, it's far more ranging. It's almost a small corpus of people. They're far more stretched across the country than just simply New York. And I think if we look at it that way, that ties to the local history, that it also goes to Ethelbert's idea of these kinds of, I don't want to call them, I guess, secondary lights, because they were amazing individuals during their, their lifetimes, but they've kind of faded away. But we're now revisiting these ideas of where these things come from. And so I think that's a different way to think about the arts movement of the early 20th century as the Black Renaissance age than simply the Harlem Renaissance age. And uh, well, you know, either to, you know, to continue on that, that's exactly what people like Sterling Brown would also say, that what happens is to, if you take this, the Harlem out of it and just call it the New Negro Movement, you know, it's much more broader. It's not really confined to a city. It was all I over the applaud. country because we couldn't, we, we, that's the thing, we could not go to hotels and things. So that's where all over the country, that's where we would meet. We would meet in people's homes to, uh, to, read, up, to read poetry and things of that nature. So uh, it was all over the country. Yeah. And so I do applaud Dr. Newman for claiming her family history because to be alive and having known your aunt and to see this celebrity of her, believe me, there are going to be people looking for her. And as I shared with us, uh, Sandy, uh, Sandra, the uh, New York thing, they're, they're coming to now look at the 20th century as vintage. <laughs> so this is 100 years ago. We knew people who lived there. And, but now po, po, the 1970s now are becoming history. So that early part of the century, people are really trying to stake their claim. So I would love to see a novel done or something done to really own the narrative of who this woman was as an artist and as an African-American woman whose grandparents were enslaved and her, you know. So this is really huge because that's just one generation. We knew somebody whose parent was a child of an enslaved person. I mean, so it's not 700 years ago. So we need to start to own that and try to shape that narrative. I think it was very interesting too to talk to all the panelists to putting this together to find out how um, May Miller was uh, loath to really uh, toot her own horn. That she often uh, talked a lot about the accomplishments of her father, but didn't necessarily talk about the accomplishments that she made herself. So that that was another reason why I was just really grateful that we could get some people on here to talk about what a, what a wonderful moment she was and the contribution she made. Well, in doing uh, 
since I, since I do Black Women's History, one of the things that as we would travel around the country and talking to the women, we would Black women would tell them uh, to tell their story as well, because a lot of times they collected their husband's materials, their brothers, or uncles, or whatever, but they would not tell their own story. And a lot of times, their you know, so their story would get left out. So one of the things that we tried to do was to make sure that women understood that their story was important and also to try to get your collection somewhere where it can be researched later on. So uh, uh, that becomes very important uh, to us as, we, as, as, as each generation is doing his, uh, uh, history and writing history, we need those resources to, 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 to come mm -hmm. to so that we can uh, get books out and things on these particular people. You know, I would just say just for this record, um, um, you know, um, Grace Cavallari, James Early, and myself, we were responsible for Sterling Brown being made the, the Port Lord of Washington, D.C. Uh, and that made a, he, he was, that was something he was really appreciative of. The other thing that happened is that um, me and Douglas Johnson who was in theater, we put together a material to make May Miller the Port Laureate uh, of Washington, D.C., but then May die. Uh, and then because I was at, on the Arts Commission, I was looking at the elders, okay, Sterling Brown, then it was May Miller, and then it was Dolores Kendrick. So that's why Dolores Kendrick became the Poet Laureate. Um, but you know, what I was always looking at were these women who were um, the elders, you know, and just like Sterling Brown, you know, I came to DC, somebody made reference to him being the Poet Laureate, but he wasn't officially the Poet Laureate. You know, it's like, you know, you know, Malcolm X Park is Meridian Hill Park until somebody goes downtown and changes it and makes it official. But I think when I look at what happened to Dolores Kendrick, who was Port Laureate of DC for 18 years, it enhanced her reputation. You know, she was the second Port Laureate. And, and, and you know, I've thought about the fact that, you know, people overlooked Dolores Kendrick. And this is why I go back and I made reference to Amazu Bolton. Amazu Bolton came to this area, and I think this worthy of a major study of him as a publisher. He's the first person that said, I'm a publisher, not just a poet. And he was publishing Mae Miller. Um, and Dolores Kendrick, when he was like in, you know, the South and also in California. And, and it just showed you the work that we needed to do right here. And he was responsible for May Miller having a first reading on Howard's campus and Lucille Clifton. He brought Lucille Clifton down from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. That's the first time she read on Howard's campus, you know? And so with the thing that we're doing today is so important because, you know, you look at the work that Brian has done in terms of documenting the work, going through the, the files and stuff. And so the papers are not just sitting there. And you know, Janet, like, like, you know, the librarians can collect, but the scholars still have to come and do the, do come the, and do the research. Right, mm -hmm. yes. And we need to have them to give them some information. A lot of times they don't know who the people are. So a lot of times we try to introduce them to these folks so that they will know, okay, there's somebody other than that you can do some research on. And uh, sometimes it gets to be a dissertation, it gets to be a book, hopefully it gets to be a film at some point. So uh, what we try to do is to introduce people. To, so some of these folks that are not as well known as the big people that we, we think about on a daily basis. So uh, it's, it's vitally important that, that we collect, preserve, and then also that we get the people in there to do the research. Yes. I, was, I would add that, uh, I would just say for everybody's benefit that I was lucky that May Miller's materials are digitized. And yeah. if you ever want to take a look at them, they're at Emory and Atlanta. So I didn't have to fly down to Atlanta. Even during COVID, I was able to call up the librarian and say, can I get access? And they give you like a 30 day access of materials to that kind of thing. You do have to pay a small fee, but it's not that much. But it is in her father's materials are there as well. So it's an extensive, they have an extensive papers in Emory at so if you ever feel like you want to do it it's there for anybody I, I I'm focusing on a specific part of May Miller's life so it helps me out that I don't have to look at every box <laughs> <laughs> digitization has really opened things up and uh because it's very expensive to do but it really opens it up so that people because a lot of times we don't have the grant money to travel to these collections so digitization has really opened up some new doors for us to do research awesome. okay i'm going to share my screen really quickly here if i can Oh, yes. 
As an educator at Frederick Douglass High School for 20 years, May Miller influenced the lives of hundreds of students. Let's hear from one of her students, Dr. Ruth Sheffy. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I've been enjoying this program immensely. Uh, in 1942, I was in the 11th grade at Frederick Douglass Senior High School. And when I walked into May Miller's classroom, we sat quietly, she would have us to, and then she would breathe deeply and then say, she sells the seashells down by the seashore. And then she said, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Her theory was that she told us that we were lip lazy. And so she started each one of her English and speech classes with a tongue twister. Now, and I was impressed as an 10th and 11th grader with May Miller. So I evidently entered into those exercises with great fervor, carried away with it, you know. So much so that Granville Marshall, who was Thurgood Marshall's nephew, the only one in our crowd who had a car, so he drove us all to parties and whatnot. Whenever he met me in the hall, he'd stop and say, she sells seashells down by the seashore. Well, I dismissed that because uh, I just knew that he was crazy. But I knew I wanted to be a teacher like that teacher. And I was at Morgan State University for 61 years. Enjoyed every, every minute of it. Loved being it. But caught a lot of that fire from May Miller. Oh. And of course, she now she she didn't tell us that uh, uh, she was a poet. She didn't read her poetry to us as Nick Aaron Ford did at Morgan. He, he gave his poetry to us as a treat just before holidays. But I didn't know she was a poet. It was not until later, about the 1950s, that I had, the end of the 50s, that I had taken a master's degree from Howard University and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. When I discovered in my classes, we did a, a, a proposal to the National Humanities and Dialogue and whatnot, and got the, a whole new approach to the humanities and sort of a worldwide approach to the humanities, that I discovered May Miller's poetry. Delighted to do that, because I didn't know she was a poet. And then read all these marvelous things about her, that she was not only a Washington poet, but that they called her a Washington institution. So I was just, a, you know, just, just thrilled uh, uh, to know all that. And her, to know that her poetry, and I taught her poetry in class, to know that her poetry ranked at the top of the, 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 the Harlem Renaissance group. Uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, someone mentioned, and I enjoyed this conversation, mentioned Zora Neale Hurston. That's a sort of aside for me because you know here at Morgan, we founded the Zora Neale Hurston Society. Mm -hmm. The first uh, academic society named for one of our poets was Langston Hughes. I'm a past president of the Langston Hughes Society. But here at Morgan in 1984, we founded the Zora Neale Hurston uh, Society. Now, let me give you no another aside. You mentioned Zora and May. Let me tell you something about that. May Miller and Zora Hurston were both enrolled in the preparatory section of Morgan. Morgan had a preparatory school for those going into college and May Miller was in it. Well, they became very close friends. Zora had no money at all, no, no back, no one backing her or anything. She worked in a trustee's household. But they both finished the preparatory section at the same time. Zora and May Miller were close friends. May Miller said to Zora, well, Zora, you know, you should be a Howard woman. And if you want to go to Howard, you come to Washington and you can stay with me. 
I didn't hear them say that about Zora and May. So if you come to Washington, you can stay with me. And so uh, Zora, instead of staying at Morgan, which is what she was going to do, she had a job, went to Washington and became a Howard student. So I think that it tells you something about May too, Miller. It tells you something about the generosity of her spirit that shows in her poetry. So I think it's it, it, that's an aside. Well, making because her poetry ranked with the best of them. When I taught the Hall of Renaissance, her poetry was at the top of it. Uh, but then I got the delightful news later on too that the sorority which she chose was the one that I, without knowing that May Miller was an AKA soror, I chose at Morgan to be an Alpha Kappa Alpha soror. I'm a diamond soror now. I've been a soror for 75 years. Oh. I was made in 1940, they say six, I, I thought five, but anyway, 45 <laughs> or six, anyway, anyway. But anyway, um, but so that was delightful news to me that I had picked uh, a sorority that May Miller was also very important in. She was such an inspiring teacher, an inspiring teacher uh, and, and a moving, and aware, a woke poet, moving mm -hmm. and aware poet, because her poetry included as a kind of background frequently classical allusions, um, classical figures and whatnot, but also mixed with modern ideas, modern thoughts, aware thoughts. Uh, and so she, she, she was quite special. Um, May Miller was uh, <laughs> an early star um, in the, those ranks not filled, you know, by a lot of women. Um, but she inspired her students. She inspired me. And she made me want to be the kind of teacher she was, a caring teacher, um, a, 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 an aware teacher, a teacher who cared about them and who saw their good qualities, who looked for the good qualities in them, and so on. That was the light she gave forth in the 40s to me. And I never outlived that light. I'm 95 now. Oh, and I never outlived that, that uh, energy, that caring, that intellect that she uh, uh, gave to me as a young student. Now, somebody mentioned the Davis and the Joyce um, um, at the Reading volume of her poetry. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I went back to it. I looked, went to my bookshelf and I went back to that volume. It's a nice thing when you retire. You can take your time and read what you want to read when you want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, but uh, <clears throat> she was called, I see in that volume, a Washington institution, Ethelbert Milt Miller. I, I taught some of his poetry in my humanities classes too. He's, a, he's an outstanding poet, Ethelbert Miller, and I want him to know that I, I had some classes over the years that I told that. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> they called her a Washington institution as well as a, a Washington poet. And Arthur Davis, Arthur P. Davis, who was, who was teaching at Howard when I was there in, in the master's program, wrote that her poetry was, he said, it was um, partially from yesterday, but bringing it up today, uh, picking, he said, the classical uh, and biblical allusions as a kind of background, but bringing it up to modern verse and putting old wine, he said, and I'm quoting from him, that she put old wine, old wine into new bottles, you know, the biblical allusions. So that she received many, many honors. You've heard about all those honors uh, and so on, many of them. 
uh, Martin Luther King speaking at all the important, reading at all the important libraries, Martin Luther King Library, the uh, invited uh, everywhere to speak. Um, and I told you the Zora Neale Hurston story, but it was that young exuberant teacher insisting on careful speech. You keep, you keep everybody says February now, but May Miller didn't let us say February. We had to say February, <laughs> but I don't. I think they think they think we would be wrong now. Everybody says February. Anyway, May Miller wouldn't let that happen in her class. Uh, <laughs> it was that it was that high school teacher, that high school teacher, who indelibly etched on me the the values that we would want to lead our young people, our students. Uh, she was so inspirational. Um, and here, 61 years later, I see her, I remember her as she was then. And I remember that she was just a commanding presence, a commanding presence. Um, her poetry, I went back, they told me where uh, she, she, she was published in the Davis volume. And I went back to my bookshelf and uh, that's a good thing you can do that and pull that down and um, uh, and and I saw that the dedicatory poem uh, that well in that in that book um, what did she say it it was something it was a line that I wanted that I said oh my goodness it sounds so much like her it was from her poetry um, and I pulled it out but I don't see it now in any event. She, uh, in, in conclusion, I would say, she, what would she say to you today? She was a very, very aware, politically aware woman. She would say to you, contribute, vote, vote, write. And also, so join, uh, groups that are doing, are moving us forward socially and so on. Um, remember John Lewis said that when you, when you pray, when you want to change things, he said, move your feet, move mm -hmm. your feet. So she, May Miller would tell you that in her, in her own distinctive way in her own way that just impressed me, made me want to be that kind of teacher to live up to what, what she was doing. So I'm gonna kind of pull that to a, pull it to a close now, but I do want you to turn to look on March, this coming March, this coming Thursday, the, the end of the Women's Month, though we celebrate women all year, but the end of the official Women's Month is Thursday at 11 o'clock in more the State University, we have the sixth annual Sheffield Lecture. I funded it, but uh, one of our students, Joanne Gabin, who's made a great name for herself at James Madison University. As a matter of fact, she and her husband had a building named for them there last year. Joanne Gabin is the speaker. 11 o'clock, go to the Morgan website uh, and you'll see that lecture. It's an hour, 11 to 12. Uh, and you'll hear her uh, speaking. I hope you'll, you'll join us there. Um, finally, what, what can I say? I, all I can say is that I'm just delighted to hear, the, uh, hear her niece talk about her and all of the, and Ethelbert, because I've been reading his poetry. He's a quite, he's an outstanding poet. Uh, and I, I'm glad that May recognized him as such. Uh, and my dear friend, the archivist at Morgan, we never had, had, I was at Morgan 61 years, and we didn't have an archivist until my time in 2011. <laughs> All right, so I, I hear you want me to stop. All right, thank you for, for allowing me to speak uh, about May Miller, who was just not only a great woman, a great teacher, and a great Alpha Kappa Alpha woman. Sorrow. Thank you.
I've placed in the chat the Ruth Sheffy lecture link, so you can check the link to join the event at the sixth annual Ruth T. Sheffy lecture. Thank you. That was just wonderful to hear firsthand uh, from one of May Miller's students um, how, um, how she impacted her life. So we just wanted to give this certificate, which we will be mailing to uh, Dr. Newman um, from the chapter. It's a certificate of recognition that is awarded posthumously to May Miller Sullivan in appreciation of her years as a teacher in the Baltimore City Public School System. She was an inspiration to all of her students, as you just heard. We also wanted to tell you about a art contest um, that the chapter is hosting, the Epsilon Omega chapter. This is the first year of that contest. And it will be called the May Miller Art and Creative Writing Contest. Uh, the theme of that contest, May Miller talked about the importance of humankind with no barriers due to race. So with this theme in mind, the, the criteria includes a Maryland or District of Columbia student in middle school, uh, must be your own original concept and not a copy of another person's copyrighted material. There's some information here about submissions for the creative art, uh, artwork or writing. Um, you can see the monetary prizes on this side. So this information will be posted and we are hoping that middle schoolers will enter this contest and get um, just another opportunity to hear and uh, uh, know a little more about May Miller. There's a contest already being held for college students at uh, Howard University. So I wanted to include here as well, the survey link for today's uh, event. I am going to put this link into the chat and we'd like everyone here to please take a, uh, advantage to um, rate what you thought about tonight's event and it, give us any comments uh, as well. And now I will turn it back over to uh, Efrantine. E. Francine, are you still there? I think you may be on mute. Okay, well, uh, what I'd like to do at this step, at this point is if, if we could, there are a lot of family members that we think um, of May Miller who may have joined this call. And if so, we'd like you all to sort of introduce yourselves. You can just take yourself off mute and introduce yourselves and tell us who you are and how you're related. We already know, uh, uh, Dr. Newman, do you want to start with yourself? Um, sure. Um, May Miller is my grand aunt. She is my... Oh. Oh, there goes my, that's my sister, Agnes. Hey, Ann. So, um, and I really appreciate everything that everybody has done so far. Hey, hi. Oh, hey, Freddie. See, they're there. Say something. Agnes, <laughs> would you, would you unmute yourself and tell us about the relationship you have? Uh, well, I'm Agnes. I'm, 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 I'm unmuted. Okay. You know, everybody gets, acts like I don't know how to do this technology, you but I am unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm Miller's sister, so Aunt May was my great aunt. This is my daughter, Frederica. Hello. And this is her daughter, Layla. <laughs> so we are carrying on the, the fine tradition May has set for us this high bar of strong, black, competent women. And uh, so happy to have the new generation uh, already exhibiting uh, great skills uh, for such a young age. 
And uh, Aunt May, uh, my fondest memories are when you go to her house, she would always tell you about her travels and show you items that she had collected along the way. And she was, uh, I mean, she, how could I say, she was the uh, Southern belle of black people. Now she could really <laughs> outclass anyone. And she always said it in such a pleasant, you know, soft spoken voice. But you know when you got told off. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Are there any other family members here that want to say something? Hi. Sure, go ahead. I'm uh, Sheba. I'm one of those fabulous people um, my mother was just talking about. <laughs> um, and uh, I am May Miller's great niece. Yeah. Great, great niece. Great, great, exactly. Super extra great niece. <laughs> Wonderful. And and Sheba is a talented writer and Thanks. performer in her own right. Hi, I'm much. Rain. I'm Miller Newman's daughter. This is my daughter, Micah. This is one of my grandsons, Caden. Unlike his twin brother, he won't take a nap. <laughs> and just the FYI, um, I actually lived across the hall from Aunt May while I was in college. So I got to interact with her um, pretty much on a daily basis up until she passed in 1995. Wonderful, wonderful. Did we get them all? Well, I might be pulling up the rear here. And so as you see, I'm adorned here in these beautiful colors of pink and green. My name is Dr. Kelly Newman Moore and um, Miller Newman and Agnes Newman are my aunts. Um, their brother is my father. So I am another great, great um, niece and my fondest memories. And I was born in 1970. So that was um, at a time I did not appreciate and understand the full value of what Aunt May had to offer. But as a little girl, I can remember visiting and on holidays, her sharing her poetry. And the one thing that just stands out in my mind is her poise and her grace and her gracefulness and her eloquence in speech and all of the things that you all have shared um, today. Um, and I am a proud member, third generation now, um, Alpha Kappa Alpha woman. I hail currently um, from Brevard County, Florida, which is east of Orlando from the Iota Pi Omega chapter, um, celebrating 31 years um, on March the 24th. And so I just can remember um, Aunt May what she stood for and those values. Um, my mom was a soror. She is now um, passed away and deceased, but um, just a, a beautiful spirit. And um, hopefully we are carrying on all of those things. And Ms. Sheffy, to you, I learned something as a family member today. Um, you as a student, just hearing your story, I was not aware that Aunt May was friends with Zora Neal, Neal Hurston. And of course, I live close to, um, we have a Zora Neal Hurston festival um, here in the uh, uh, Central Florida area and had no idea the closeness that Aunt May um, shared with um, with Ms. Hurston. So I just like to say thank you all for hosting this um, outstanding, amazing event today. Um, we wish you well, and it was just a, a pleasure to, to be with you. Thank you very much. So I wanted to show you one final thing before turning it over to Ephraim to close us out. This is a copy we were able to obtain of one of May Miller's books. It is a first edition. There were only 400 copies and we have one. And this copy is going to um, the Epsilon Omega chapter. As you've heard, uh, May Miller is a um, founder for our chapter. And so this copy will go into the archives for our chapter. So we're very happy about that. Um, this is another of her books, Dust of an Uncertain Journey, and it, it will have the same home within our chapter. 
And uh, one, one thing we also wanted to mention as Ethelberg mentioned to us several times as we have gone through this journey is that Mae Miller was a, an unbelievable poet, but she was also an unbelievable playwright. And there are a wonderful uh, amount of plays um, that you can find through Emory on some of the, the plays that she has, she has written, many some on Harriet Tubman and other historical figures. So please, if you are going to do some research into Mae Miller, take a look not only at her poetry, but her plays. Um, and at that, I will turn it over to uh, Efrancine, our mistress of ceremonies. Well, thank you so much. And I must say, I want to apologize. I lost uh, my connection at the very end, at the conclusion of Sheffrey, Dr. Sheffrey's remarks, which was so warm and enlightening. We hope that each of you have enjoyed tonight's um, event. And please complete the survey following um, the um, this activity, it has indeed been a sincere pleasure to share May Miller, A Woman's History. Have a great evening. Okay.